Hello YouTube people! Before getting into this video, make sure that you have Python and Pygame installed. Once you do that, let's get to the fun stuff! Okay, that video title is a little clickbaity, because technically you'll be working with someone else's game, mine, before making your own from scratch. I've saved you six hours of work and boring YouTube tutorial video content with this strategy. You're welcome. I find it quickest to learn by copying and modifying someone else's code. Just pick it apart, see how it works, and then when you make your own game you'll have foundational knowledge and code to refer to. But first, we need to set up an easy to use folder structure so that we can keep everything organized. I'll show you my method, which I use to just copy paste when I want to start making a new game. I have a projects folder, and in that I group by my systems. In this case, let's just focus on the Python folder for now. Think of that as your base working directory because that's how I'll be referring to it. So next, in Sublime Text, make sure you go to File, and then uh, Open Folder, and you'll want to browse to that directory. So this will open up the sidebar for easy navigation. Now next, go ahead and download the files you'll need for this tutorial from GitHub. I have a link in the description and you want to place these files in the Python folder you made. Once you've downloaded and installed those files into that location, you'll see them on your navigation folder. I've created a file structure and included some basic assets. You should see the new files and folder in the sidebar. Open up tutorial.py in Sublime Text. Before we dig into the code, we need to configure a couple of preferences in Sublime Text. In the bottom right, it's a little bit hard to see on here, but it should say Spaces 4. Even if it says Tab Size, go ahead and change it to Spaces. Next to that, you'll see Python. This means that Sublime Text recognizes that this is a Python file and will help with color coding and a few other features. It's important to note that we'll be following the style guide for Python, which is linked in the description. The reason why we're following this guide is so that we make readable code. It's a fun read, but it is a good idea to get familiar with it. But don't worry, we'll teach according to the guide and you better not pick up any bad habits. The next thing you'll want to do is click on View and go down to Ruler and set this to 78. This will, this will place a visual indicator on where the maximum line length should be. While there is wiggle room, and in fact the guide explicitly says to limit at 79, we're setting it to 78 because it's better to round down. Don't be afraid if your code goes beyond this limit, but it will affect readability. And this is a personal preference, but I like to click on view and make sure word wrap is set to off. Word wrapping will make your code harder to read. After that, click on view, layout, columns two, and this will add a new column. Again, personal preference, but since we'll be working with many files, we're going to need to use all the available spell space that we can. Now that we are set up, we can finally start coding. I'm not a fan of watching people type code in tutorial videos, which is why I had you load up code and then I'll go through and explain what's going on here. So included is a little readme file, and um, all the sound effects and music are free for personal and commercial use. Same with the font. You're free to use these, no problems. The same with the, this code. You can use it however you want. The first file we're going to look at is tutorial.py. At the top we have a comment block stating this is a tutorial game, free license, who made it. At the very top of Python files, what you want to do is keep your imports up at the top. We're importing from the Python library and related libraries. How I have this set up is I have code split into separate files. If I had all the code in one single file, there would be a lot of scrolling and that would be very hard to read. We don't want that. So I have separate file includes. I'll go ahead and load up player. This is why you want this layout of side by side. So you can be working in your main file and then your include file if you need to access it. It's just right there, and so you can click back and forth. Good stuff, right? We're not going to worry about going through the include file yet. That'll be a little bit later. For now, let's focus on the tutorial, main tutorial. 
The first thing you want to do is run it, of course. So press Control B if you're in the Sublime Text, which I suggest you do. Let's see what this game does. It's a little spaceship. You can fire lasers. There's some terrain, which the bullets or the lasers have uh, collision detection. It'll randomly spawn enemies. The enemies will fire as well. And of course, we can shoot the enemies. When the enemies are destroyed, they animate into a little explosion. I can show it. And when they do, up at the top, we get 100 points for each enemy we blow up. And of course, if we get hit by a laser, game over. We just exit out immediately. At the very top, under our includes, we're going to initialize. We're going to set up some environment variables for Pygame. Pygame uses SDL, and we can set up the window position to always pop up at the same spot. And I have it set to 100 by 100. So every time we run this, it's going to pop up in the top left. And you always do that before you call Pygame in it. So the Pygame library gets initialized with just one line of code. It is so easy. After that, we'll need to create our screens for display. And uh, I use a ratio to scale it up. I have a ratio set to 5, so I can actually see it on a big screen. Because the original size, or the native size is this size. This is 320 by 240. So ratio of three, it's three times as big. Right? Easy enough. Let's keep it at five. So what we're going to do is we're going to set up our screens. We have a display screen, which is set to our width and height. And we're going to copy it onto a second screen. This is a draw screen, so everything that we draw, we're going to place onto the draw screen. And then what we'll do is we'll scale it up by the ratio and display on the display screen. So after that, we're going to load up an icon for the window, and we're going to set an icon for the window. We do this before actually setting up the screen so that it appears, because you can't change it after it appears. So we have our window mode, and this is where we scale it up by our ratio. It's the width multiplied by the ratio, the height multiplied by the ratio. And if you want, you can set the, a flag for full screen mode. If you do full screen, you don't want to set the ratio. So, if you run it full screen, it looks weird on stream, but it's full screen, trust me. The next thing, we want to set the mouse invisible. Ah, one thing I didn't show off, so it's hard to see, but right here in the top left is the icon, and then the mouse cursor, when we move it onto the screen, it vanishes. And of course, we can set the caption, Tutorial Spaceship Shooter, in the title. Next we have a clock, which is used to cap our frame rate. And you'll see scattered throughout the code is clock 60. That says it to 60 frames per second. After that, we're going to load our static images. We have a background image in our assets, which we're going to load and convert for us to use. Of course, we need to load up our font. And the author suggested to set the font size to 14, as that is what is lo looks best. Then of course we're going to load up our sound effects. We have a player shoot, but it's a little bit too loud, so we're going to change the volume to be at 50%. Then we're going to load up the sound effect for the enemy dying, but we don't need to change the volume. But the option is there if you want to mess with it. We'll have a music track playing on loop, so we need to get that loaded. After that, we're going to set up our sprites. We use, uh, we have our main player, and it's going to be called from the player class. The player class is in this include file, player.py. So the class name is player, and this is what it refers to. 
player equals player. As soon as we call the player class, it's going to immediately run the initialize function. This is, I guess, what you could call a constructor. So it's going to run all this code immediately and then pop back here and set it up for the player. We do the same thing for the terrain. We have a ceiling and a ground, but we're passing these numbers here. So in the terrain include, what we're passing is actually the land type. So when we initialize it, we're going to set the land type, which is just a flag to determine which image and location of the sprite to use. We'll dig through this in a little bit, but just real quick, we have zero for the ceiling, otherwise anything else is going to be the ground. For our enemies and lasers, we need to, since there's going to be multiple of them, we need to put them into groups. So we use sprite groups for that. See, all this is pretty easy, right? Once we finish our initialization, now we need to define a function. We have a function for game text. And I like to use this because all, I, all you need to do is put in the x value, the y value, and if you want it centered or not. And this will handle placing it onto the screen, onto the draw screen, at the location. And if we want it centered, it does the math for you. It takes the length of the text and centers it. And here, it actually renders the text with the color value. So I have it at 255, 255, 255, which is an RGB value. So if we set one of these to zero, well, if we set two of these to zero, and then run this, you'll see that instead of white, it's now red. So right here, it's red. And it's kind of hard to see, too. So let's keep that at white. And what you could do, you could set up some color definitions, but I like to keep it at the color values. And the reason why I like to keep it at the color values is because when I use a tutorial, or when I make a tutorial for uh, making sprites, we're going to be working with these color values instead of color constants. We're going to blit, which means place the text that we rendered onto a location. And these brackets mean a list. And a list is well, what it looks like. It's a list of variables. So an X and Y value. So it's going to place a font at the X and Y value that we passed. After that, we have the main game loop and everything happens here. So we define main, but first off, how do we make sure this is going to be called first? I'm going to scroll all the way down to the bottom. And this is a very important thing you need to have. If name equals main, we're going to call the main function. You need this at the very end of your code in order for it to run correctly. Because if you don't have that there, it's not going to run. So scrolling back up, this function is called, and we're going to set up some startup variables. We have an enemy spawn timer, which uses the uh, Python Pygame time function, and we're going to add 9 seconds. It gets pretty granular, but we have 9,000 milliseconds. We have a flag for the fire button. So, if you're holding the button down, we're going to change this flag from up to down. We're going to prepare the, spi the sprite groups by emptying them out. This is always good to do whenever you start a new level. It's good to initialize too, just make sure there's no garbage in there. To keep our game loop going, we have a variable named player alive, because that's if the player's dead, we're going to stop the loop. And of course we need a variable to track the player's score. 
now we can start the music loop because we're right about to start the actual game loop. And what we need to do is pass a negative one, which means to repeat the music track. This music track is only about a five second loop, so we did it to repeat longer than five seconds. So while the player is alive, we're going to loop. And this is where indenting is very important because anything indented under a loop, and as you can see, is four spaces, it's going to be considered part of that loop. And the very first thing we're going to do is handle our events. Events in Python handle things like uh, key presses or, in this case, Pygame Quit, if we click the X to close the window. So if we click the X, it calls Pygame Quit, and we're going to return quit. When we return from a function, when we return from the main function, we're going to go back down here, and it's done. And it's going to gracefully shut down Pygame, Pygame quit, and our program is done. The same thing happens if there's a key down event. We're going to check the event for which key was pressed. In this case, the escape key. Events are good if you just want to check if a key is down or up. But for actual game movement, I like to use key polling. Key polling handles the key up and key down actions. <clears throat> so key, whenever a key is pressed, it's going to assign it into this, I like to call it an array. So if you press the space button, it's going to add it to the key, well, the key list, I should say. And it's going to set it to true. So, player pushes the space bar. It's going to add it to the, the get pressed key list. It's going to set it to true, which means we're pressing the button. And our flag here, if the player was firing as up, we're going to set it to pressed. Now we have another variable here for the player gun loaded. And this is the variable we use to space out our firing. So if, uh, if this wasn't here, then it would be shooting out laser every time uh, the key was pulled. So as long as we're holding on the, the space bar, it'd be shooting out a stream of lasers. And we need to space that out a little. So we're using a variable here to handle that timing. And whenever a laser is shot, we're going to play the sound effect. Now we need to initialize a new laser and we'll add it to the laser group. So our laser, we're going to call the laser class. And we'll load up the include, and again, lasers, and it's going to immediately initialize. Once it's initialized, we're going to set the X and Y location of the laser to the player location. So we're setting it right on top of the player. And then we have a flag that says if it's a player's laser, in this case zero, and then we'll add the sprite to the group. So we have our key space press down equals true. Otherwise, if the key is false, which means the player is not holding on the button, we're going to change our flag, player fire button. If it's down, we're going to change it to release. We also have handling for left, right, up, and down. And now as you can see, we're calling functions within the player class. So player move left. We are going to scroll down and it's going to call this function, move left. So it's going to simply check if the player location is greater than zero, which is the left side of the screen. Left side? Left side of the screen is going to move the player left and butt up against the edge of the window by two pixels. So when we move left, it's going to move all the way to the left side of the screen and stop. Otherwise, if we didn't have that there, the player could just move off the screen and be gone. 
So one thing you'll notice, if we push Control B while in the class, it's going to try and run the class, and it's just not going to work. It's just going to finish immediately. That's why we need to run within the, the main tutorial file. Alright. After that, we have some game logic we need to handle. We have the enemies and a, and a timer of when to spawn an enemy. I don't know why I have that twice. Let's clean that up. So, uh, Pygame time get ticks is always going. It's a clock. And that's what we base our timers off of. So as this increases, it's going to check against the enemy timer plus one second. So it's going to spawn a new enemy every second. When it does, we're going to res reset the enemy spawn timer equal to the clock. So as the clock keeps going, the spawn timer is just going to stay there. So spawn timer plus a thousand, it hits it, it's going to spawn a new enemy. And of course, enemy equals the enemy class. Another include, it's going to initialize. And this has a little bit more initialization for an enemy, which we'll go through in a bit. So we're going to force place the enemy off screen on the right side of the window, like off. And then we're going to use the random function to place the Y value. And we want to place it in between the train and the train is 40 pixels high, so if you spawn it in the train, it's going to blow up. We don't want that. And then, of course, add it to the group. Then we have enemies firing a laser. So the enemies, they also have this gun loaded variable, and it's to space out their firing. And the exact same thing with the player, we're going to have a new laser, we're going to set it to the enemy location, and we're going to flag 1 instead of 0, which signifies it's an enemy's laser, and of course add it to the group. As of that, we have some hit detection. So what we're doing for hit detection, we're going to use Collide Mask. I'll show you. In the enemy class, for example, we're going to create a mask for collision. Now we do is we create a, a mask from surface and we're just going to grab one of the animation frames and we're going to see if those masks collide and the mask is for the whole image the, the image is a square and we have a color in the square that we're going to treat as a mask in this case pure black so in our sprite sheet when we set the color key to zero, 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 that means black. It's going to mask out that color. All right. So the, when the mask of the player collides with the mask of the ceiling or the mask of the player collides with the mask of the ground, the player isn't alive anymore. It's just going to so if I float up here, as soon as I hit, that's awkward, oh it's not on there, it was moving in. Okay, so as soon as it, the mask collides with the train, game over. And we're going to do the same hit detection for lasers. So if the laser type is zero, which means it's a player laser, we're going to check to see if that player laser has collided with any of the enemy lasers. But we're not going to compare one mask with another mask. We need to compare one mask with the entire group. So we use Sprite Collide, which checks that one laser within the laser group against the entire enemy list. And this third parameter is either true or false and if it's true it's going to kill it immediately but we don't want to do that quite yet we, we need to do some stuff first and then we're going to pass the collide mask for the sprite so that it can actually check pixel perfect against the masks to see if it's overlapping and if it is it's going to return true for the enemy hit list so the enemy hit list is another group 
And if the enemy is alive, we're going to set enemy is false. We're going to increment our score. We're going to play a sound effect, and then we're going to remove the laser. So the reason why we want this to false is because if there was a collision, it's going to remove the enemy immediately. We don't want to do that. We want to animate the explosion of the enemy. So looking in the enemy class, we have a flag, alive equals true. So as soon as we set it to false, we have our animation frames. The first three of the animation frames is just the enemy with the little fire coming out of the engine. And then the next four we're adding onto it is a four frame animation of the enemy exploding. So if the enemy is alive, and the frame is greater than two, like three, it's just going to loop those first three frames. Otherwise, if the enemy is dead, then we're going to let that animation play the last four frames, which is the explosion. And after it explodes, then we're going to remove the enemy. And that's why we have this set to false. So if the laser type is equal to one, that means it's an enemy laser. And we're just going to do check, since the player is in a group, we're gonna check the mask of the laser, that's one laser, and that one player. And we're going to just set the game loop to equal to false, which is just going to break out of the game loop. And of course, if the laser hits the train ceiling or the ground, we're just going to remove the laser. So all that chunk of code handles collision. So as our ground comes in, we're going to see it collides with the ground. And it collides with the enemies. And as we destroy the enemies, you can see the animation, the four frame animation of the enemy exploding. And of course, laser hits the player, game over. And we're getting towards the end of our game loop, so all we got to do is we need to update and draw everything. So, we're going to call our player update, which is a function. And in the update, we have more game logic, which I'll cover when we go through each of the frames, or each of the includes. And same with enemy. Enemy has an update as well. Every single one has an update, so we need to call it. And we also update the sprite groups. So when we update the sprite groups, it'll call the update for each individual sprite within the group. <clears throat> and after that, we're going to draw the background now normally, if you don't have a background, you're, you need to clear the screen. Otherwise, you're going to get some smearing. And I'll show you what that means. So if we don't have a background, we're just going to smear everywhere. And this is going to be a big ol' mess. I think it's kind of cool looking, because we're, we're just kind of drawing. This is like future art. <laughs> That's why we need that background. That background is going to be drawn onto the screen. It's going to overlap everything. And so that'll clear the screen. And that way we can draw our enemy list. And draw is another function. So again, in our group, it's gonna call the draw for every single, every single sprite within that group. And all we're doing is replacing the image the currently set image and the location onto the window or onto the screen. I call it window screen. And our image is determined by our update. And just real quick, our image is set to an animation frame loop. So we do that for all of our sprites, including the player and the terrain. After that, we're going to display the score on the top middle of the screen, like way up there. 
This is the middle of the screen, 10 pixels down, and we're going to set it centered, true. So this function, at the very top, same parameters, text, x, y, centered. We talked about this earlier. Easy stuff, right? So we've been doing all this drawing onto the draw screen, and what we need to do is we need to resize it to the actual display screen. So we use Pygame Transform Scale, the draw screen, which is at 320 by 240. We're going to get the size of that, 320 by 240, and the location, the top left corner, and we're going to transform it and place it, blit means like place, onto the screen. So it's scaled up and placed. And then what we're going to do when we flip, that tells Pygame to actually display the screen. And here is our timer function. This, this caps our frames per second to 60. And all that that we went over is in our game loop. That's a lot, huh? This is why indentation is important. So for out, we're out of our game loop. As soon as the game loop is done, we're going to stop our music. And that's it. So the Pygame is going to go down and be like, oh, this is outside of the function. This is outside of our main function. So that means, must mean this is the end of the function. And we've reached the end of the file. Here's our main, here's our quit. And as you can see, 256 lines. That's a good number. So it's pretty small, but we did a lot of talking about it. Now we're going to go through each of the includes. So we'll go in order, starting with the player. And it's important that we have a separate import for everything we're going to use within that class. And if we need to do other includes, in this case the sprite sheet, you'll notice that the sprite sheet is not included in our main function. That's because we're not loading any sprites into our function. We're only loading sprites into our includes. So the sprite is loaded into player. And again, the sprite sheet, it initialize, we pass it a file name, it loads the file and it converts it to something that Pygame can use and it sets it to the sprite sheet. <clears throat> so when we call sprite sheet, we pass it the file name and it sets it to the sprite sheet. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to load our sprites. So after we load our sprite sheet, we're going to get the image at zero, zero and it's going to be 16 pixels wide and tall. Oops. So here's our first frame and we're going to put it into the first location of our animation frame list. And then our second frame, it's the same thing, but different. It's the same but different. Same with the third frame. And all we're animating is the fire at the end of the jet. Our fourth frame, that's the laser. We don't want that. We just want these first three frames. And then our image. The image is what we're going to actually draw onto the draw screen. We want to go ahead and set it to the initial frame of zero, which is the very first element of the list. And then from that image, since it's the same size for all the frames, we're going to create a mask. And this mask is going to be used for collision. We're going to set up a rectangle, and the rectangle is going to be initialized to be the, uh, the width and the height of the image, which is, we've defined, 16 by 16. Alright, after that, we're going to place our player. Our player X is at 32 pixels over and 122 pixels, or 120 pixels down, so it's right in the middle of the screen. Then we're going to set our current animation frame. And then we're going to have an animation time. This is a delay of how fast we want it to animate. We also have another timer for how fast we want it to shoot. And then of course we have a variable of if it's ready to fire. So in our update function, 
we have our shoot time. This is plus 100 milliseconds. So if we set this to one second and run it, when we hold down the space key, it's only going to fire one shot per second. And that's obviously too slow. So that's why we have this at a tenth of a second. And then our animation frames are at only 50 milliseconds. And it's going to be hard to see because we're only animating three pixels on the sprite, but it's there and it's animating. And all we do is we set the frame plus one. And if the frame goes beyond how many images we have in our animation frame list, we're going to reset it to zero. And then of course we're going to update what we're going to, to display from the animation frame of our current frame. After that we have our movement functions. It's simple. We're just going to move the player within the confines of the screen. After that we're just going to draw it. That's it. That's it for a player. Only 80 lines. So for sprite sheet, we're going to load the file on initialization. Then when we get the image, we're going to get the X and Y value and the width and height. We're going to convert it into a surface that we can use. And then we're going to cut out from the entire sprite sheet that location and the width and height. And then we're going to mask out the color black in this case. So this color, black, that's our mask. We could set it to any color, but it needs to match our color key. And we'll return the image. So what I've done here is an extended image. And all this does is it takes the width of the sprite of the image and multiplies it by two. So we have two of the same sprites next to each other. And in this case, it's going to be for the train that scrolls. It's just going to scroll. When it reaches halfway off, when it reaches halfway off, it's going to move it back by half, and it's just going to keep scrolling. That's going to give us our smooth scrolling effect. After that, we have our enemy. Now, the enemy is just like the player, but it's the bad guy. We have a three frame animation, but we have four frames for enemy exploding. Again, we set our initial frame and we create a mask. We set our enemy default location as negative 16, negative 16. So that's going to be going to be off the screen right here where I'm pointing because you can't see it because it's off the screen. Okay, so we set the animation frame and animation speed. And then what we do for the firing, we're going to set it to the clock plus a random range between zero and one second. So it's not a consistent every one second fire. It's going to be somewhere in between. And the gun is ready to fire. Are we alive? Yes or no? In this case, yes. So for the enemy update, it's going to check for the shoot time, plus one second. And then it's going to reset it to the, the clock, plus the random range between one second. So as the game ticks on, it's going to be plus one second, plus another variable time. When it's ready to load, uh, then we're gonna say it's ready to ready the gun is ready to fire then we're gonna say the gun is ready to fire next we animate just like the player at a frame if the frame is more than two we're just going to repeat those first three frames as long as we're alive and if we're dead we're going to extend it to play the last four frames and then we're going to remove the sprite. So the enemy, it's just going to move across the screen at one pixel all the way across. From the right side of the screen all the way to the left. Once it reaches the left, it's going to be removed. And what we can do, we can play around with this. 
This is the part where we want you to tweak stuff. So if we set a y value, a y value is minus one. When we run this, enemies are going to scoot up. Well, they're going to scoot up that way. As you see, they'll fly up into the train. We don't have any collision for the enemies, so they're just going to fly up and off the screen. We could even do something crazy from negative one to one. So these enemies are going to be kind of wild now. Although if we set the range from negative one to positive one. It's gonna fly down. Mostly down. Because our starting range it's not gonna pick this. This is gonna pick up two and including one. So we actually need a negative two. So it's gonna pick from a range of from negative two to one, up two and including one. It's a little taste of how random works. As you can see, it's, they're floating kind of down. Good stuff. Let's go ahead and delete that. Mm. Once off the screen, remove it. And of course, we can draw and displace it. We're displacing it. Nothing fancy there. Except for enemy, we have our lasers. We're going to load the sprite sheet, and this only has two frames. It has a blue one for the player and a red one for the enemy. So looking at our sprite sheet, it's picking up the blue one, 48,0, and 48,16 is the red one. When we set our mask, we're going. it doesn't matter which mask we use because it's just a line of two pixels high. And the type is just a flag. Is it a player bullet or an enemy bullet? Hmm. <coughs> Jeez. Okay. So on update, we're going to move the laser. If it's a player laser, it's going to move <laughs> from the left to the right. And if it's an enemy, it's going to move from the right to the left. The player bullet moves a lot faster than the enemy bullet. That way it gives the player a chance to dodge. Because if we set it at the same speed, it's going to be a lot harder. So our bullets are moving at 8 pixels speed. And we changed the enemy bullet from 2 to 8. So now it's going to go a lot faster. This is good for difficulty, but it might be a little too difficult. Although look at those skills. I dodged all those. Yeah, because I'm a pro game player. It's amazing. Alright, let's take that back to two. Since we're not animating anything, it's always going to be the frame of the type. And then if the bullet is off screen, we're just going to remove the bullet. And again, we're just going to draw the current image on there. Easy stuff. And last but least is our terrain. So our train is a little bit complicated in that we need it to scroll, but we're only using one sprite. A looping sprite. So if it's just that one sprite, it's going to it's going to scroll off the screen, but it's going to be nothing behind it. That's why we're going to extend it to be twice as wide. So when it scrolls halfway off, it pops back over, and it's nice and smooth. So I've explained the land type, if it's a ceiling or the ground. We're going to, once we load the image, we're going to call our custom function to extend it. And then we're going to create a mask from that one image. So we're not masking just a single sprite, we're masking the entire image. 
So if it's a ceiling, the ceiling goes at the top, the floor goes at the bottom. And we're starting them off screen, and they're going to slowly come in. So on the update, if it's a ceiling, it's going to move slowly in. And you'll see I have float values here. So the X and Y location, they're an integer, which means they have to be a whole number. They can't be a, a decimal point floating number. So we're doing some floating point math. We're going to move slowly. And then we're going to convert the float into an integer. Once it's converted, that's our actual location we're going to place the sprite. So when it's off screen, halfway off screen, mind you, it's going to update and replace the second sprite with the first one for smooth scrolling. And of course draw, we're just going to draw. So how's that? Is that easy? So now that we've finished going through the code, it's time to assign you some homework. Go through this code yourself and make your own tweaks and modifications. Get comfortable working with the code, and if you break something, fix it. If you get stuck on something, let me know, or even better, Google the problem and see if you can figure it out. Good luck and have fun! Thank you for watching.